And so sharing this with someone else is not easy to do. And I thank you, Pastor. And I thank you also, the church of the bottom of my heart, for listening to a burden and, and letting us bring the word of God to you. Our texts are going to be drawn from, let's turn to, uh, drawn from 1 John. Let's go to 1 John, the new book of 1 John. Amazing book. The whole gospel is in 1 John. Everything's there. But it is an amazing book by this very dear apostle. So if we're going to read the text, 1 John 1, 8 through 10, 2, 1, and 3, 4 through 9. So if we could stand for the reading of God's holy word, I appreciate it. And I'll start reading 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Or chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. Whosoever commits sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither know him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Father, I pray that you open hearts and plow down foul fields. And Lord, prepare me with the word. And Lord, I pray that you just give us a whistle this day. Let your Holy Spirit fall down upon this place in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Beautiful, beautiful scriptures, but confusing to some. So I want to, if I can, I want to enlighten you because God helped me. So I want to help you. I'm going to outline the context pretty carefully first because I think it's going to be very important for us all to learn about where this came from before we plunge into 1 John. Because it's an important final legacy of the last surviving apostle, the apostle closest to Jesus that had his head on Jesus' breast. And it's easy to be misinterpreted, even though it's a simple message. It's still very easy to be misinterpreted. I pray it will be an encouragement to the saints and a warning to the religious lost and to the lost in general, a warning given to love. 1 John is an unusual epistle. It was one of the last epistles written by the last surviving apostle, the Apostle John. It, it, that it was written by John, there's no dispute. It was accepted by the church for centuries. And there are striking parallels between this epistle and the Gospel of John. I'll give you one that will be pretty much definitive. The word for comforter given for us in John 14, 16 is parakletos. Parakletos. Now, in 1 John 2, 1, this epistle, Jesus is called, we turn to that, 1 John 2, 1, it says the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is going to be our advocate, right? And that word advocate also is the same word, parakletos. This word parakletos occurs five times in the New Testament, and every single time in John's writings. Nowhere else. So we know this is by John. Who is the intended, the, the intended audience in this epistle? Well, it's, it's entitled, if you notice on the first page, the first epistle general, the first epistle general of John. So maybe the Christians in general. For example, it doesn't begin with a salutation. It's not very epistle-like, is it? It doesn't begin with a salutation. There are no individual names in this epistle at all. And in the authorized version, it's called general, likely because no specific congregation is named, like Ephesians, Galatians, whatever. So it, it appears as though it's more general. However, there's evidence that this was written to a specific congregation. Because in the epistle itself, it speaks of a disturbance in the church and about false prophets who went out from us. And it says also in 2.26, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. And he calls them little children. And although there was no definitive research, source documents point to the possibility that it was to a specific congregation. That would be important because it would be him giving them advice. 
In one manuscript, the epistle is called the First Catholic, meaning general, First Catholic Epistle of St. John the Divine, written at Ephesus. And one of the Latin manuscripts calls it the Epistle to the Parthians. So there is evidence that it may be, I believe a biblically defensible stance would just say that probably this is written to a specific audience, but for certain, it's useful in general for all of us. And let's approach it that way. Most scholars date the writing of 1 John to the last decade of the first century from the 90s. And that was, so Paul, John might have been, probably was very advanced in age at that point in time. It was very difficult, very different time than Paul's times. Because during Paul's, when he was, during his tenure, they were focused on the Mosaic Law, the part of women in the church, the Gentiles, church governance, and other important issues to the church. But in John's Gospel, written much later than his, it was focused on the person of Christ and on the divine life of the believer. We need this in guidance. It's helpful to us, isn't it? But John's Gospels and his other writings were written much later. John also faced, at that point in time, the rising Gnostic heresy. They were the Gnostics. And one of the things they did was to deny that Jesus Christ was, was come in the flesh. They denied it. And you can hear that in his gospel. He says in 1 John 4, 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. So we know he was dealing with the Gnostics at that point in time. It has a, a certain authoritative and a fatherly tone to it. 1 John clearly outlines for us an uncompromising compendium or list of Christian ethics of what a Christian should be like and what we would be like if we're saved. You know, John is not really amenable to an orderly, organized division. It doesn't work that way. 1 John, excuse me. 1 John is really more thematic, and the themes are, are repeated over and over again. One theme was assurance. Aren't we glad that we have uh, 1 John 5.13? We're glad that we...